So doing homemaking and sharing it with all of you guys, like, I don't want to say it saved my life, but it definitely, like, saved my joy. And it helped me return to who I was, like, as a little girl, you know, just having fun and... Everybody. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Caitlin and I run the blog called Mrs. Midwest. Today we are doing a 200 Q, 200 K Q and A, which is really exciting, which is wonderful. And I want to get into all of your cues, but first I want to say thank you for coming back to my channel. It has been a while. It has been a while since the fall vlog and you might be wondering where is the Christmas holiday vlog that I always do? And if you're interested in the answers to that and the general life update I have for you guys, stick around till the end of the video. I'm gonna be explaining it all. I'm gonna be explaining where I've been, what's been going on. Um, but first, the questions. And a big thank you. A big thank you to all of you, all 200 thousand women, mostly women, who are part of our community, our online world. I don't really view it as like an achievement for myself. I more view it as just like a representation of how many people relate to the love of homemaking, femininity, traditional living, religious living. Um, I know that we're not all the same. Like that's one of my favorite things about my online like group of people. We're so different, but we all like mesh and accept each other and encourage each other in our various goals and femininity journeys and family life and whatever you have going on. And I just want to say thank you, big thank you to all of you for making this happen, especially because I've been so absent for the past few years, raising babies, living my life, making IRL friends. <laughs> um, but you guys are still here and that means a lot. And I just want to say thank you. And please remember, anytime you feel alone, anytime you kind of feel like no one understands me or I don't fit in in my generation or whatever, just remember there is 200,000 other people who kind of like the same stuff you do. It's encouraging to me. I hope it's an encouragement to you guys. So anyways, with all that preamble out of the way, let's dive into the questions. So the first question on everyone's mind, do you think you will have any more children? I'm reading from a screen over here, just so you know. So first of all, I want to say thank you. I had really expected to be bugged a lot more after Troy was born. When's the next one coming? Are you pregnant? Are you pregnant? Are you pregnant? I rarely get asked that. You guys are so classy. Um, but this is a Q and A. It's an appropriate time to ask these curious questions. So do you think you will have any more children? Honestly, I don't know. Right now we are so content with just two boys, which is, crazy. I think in my last Q&A video, I said I wanted four kids, right? But that was before I had ever given birth before, ever been postpartum before, ever raised a baby before. Um, so my husband is really happy with two. I'm a bit more of a fence sitter, but I have to say going through what we went through this year with Grant's injury in June, it really like changed my perspective because I was suddenly like taking care of him, taking care of both babies myself. And it just like really impacted me to thinking like, it just like, I don't know, it just killed any baby fever that might've been brewing. And instead it just made me feel really content and grateful for the family I currently have. And also just like, if anything were to happen to my husband, like I'm very comfortable with the two boys. Um, and I can't really imagine adding to that, at least not right now. Um, so, I don't know, don't expect any pregnancy announcements from us anytime soon, maybe not at all. I think this is like an area that's really sensitive in the homemaking community. I think a lot of people expect Christians in the homemaking community to be like always open for the goal of having like eight to 10 kids. Um, that's not our goal, it never really has been. And I think that's totally fine. I, I don't think it's like a moral thing. Um, I think you really need to think about what's best for your family and for your kids. So if I ever did add another baby, it would have to make sense for all the members of the family, not just me, not just my husband, like it would have to make sense for my sons too. So that was probably more information than you wanted, but yeah, don't expect a pregnancy announcement anytime soon. Okay, the next question is about losing weight. How did I lose weight after having a kid? 
you guys know I'm not like a naturally like slender person. I'm muscular. I like food. I have to actively try to stay in shape. So I um, have a hard time with that, especially after pregnancy. I'm also kind of tall. I'm like five, seven and a half, almost five, eight. So when I gain weight, it's like super all over. It's like every square inch of my body, it distributes kind of nicely. So the wonderful thing about that is I could gain pregnancy weight and I didn't look that different than I currently do. Um, but the downside is I can lose a lot of weight and no one will really notice. So I've actually lost a lot of weight. I'm lighter now than when I, uh, before I got pregnant with my eldest son. Um, I fit in like so many clothes. It's really exciting. I feel so much more energy. I can like lift my body around. I can like lift things in general. I can exercise. I just feel really, really good. So I have a blog post. I've been teasing this blog post for a while. But I have a blog post coming that goes into more detail, but essentially it's what I said in my postpartum video. Nothing has changed. I am, well, actually I don't really count calories anymore. I was when that first year I was really counting calories. And then I started like adding walks and workouts. And now I'm to the point where I'm running. And that's, I've seen the biggest difference since starting to add running um, to my fitness routine. But yeah, it's, it's not fun. Like it's not fun to count calories. It's not fun to eat less than you put out, but you know, calories in, calories out. I really believe in that. That's how I lost the weight. But the biggest thing is sleep too, sleep and rest. So for the first year after having a baby, I literally, like I do not have the mental capacity to lose weight while also raising a under one year old. Especially with Troy, I had a uh, like 18 month old and like a four month old at the same time, five, six, it's hard to do the math, but they're 11 months apart. So I was like really busy with baby stuff. I was really in the trenches. And when I'm dealing with sleeping and feeding and milestones and like nurturing and emotionally bonding and like <laughs> helping this infant develop, what I look like in my body is literally at the bottom of the totem pole of priorities. Now that the kids are older, I'm prioritizing my physical shape a lot more and I'm feeling really good about myself. I'm feeling a lot better. Um, so after Troy was one is when I started taking it a lot more seriously with just like the calorie counting and walking. And now I've added like Pilates. I've done Mutu, the diastasis recti program. My diastasis recti is like almost totally healed, which I love. I'm really happy with that. Um, so yeah, losing weight, calories in, calories out. I go over all of this in my postpartum video as well as my old old video about how I lost weight without losing my mind, I literally just did the same thing. Except now I run too, which is kind of cool. Okay, third question was about navigating femininity while being a mom or being in a healing season. So femininity is not just beauty, hair, makeup. It's also like, just to me, it's the general concept of nurturing and being nurtured. So that's why that can manifest in like making your space beautiful, making your body beautiful, taking care of yourself, or it can manifest in things that we like to do as homemakers, like cooking food for your family, decorating, like that kind of stuff. But the concept of nurturing is also like so applicable to postpartum moms um, or anyone in a tough season. And it really has to do with like resting and taking care of yourself, going easy on yourself, not being harsh, like getting away from that like harsh, like you gotta do this, like survive like mindset and entering more of like that soft girl kind of like lifestyle, which is hard when you're waking up a million times at night, when you're not like, like feeling fulfilled in life or when you're lonely or when you hate your body because you just had a baby or whatever, it can be really, really hard. So for me, what that looked like was just taking a step back. You obviously know I've barely been on YouTube. That was part of it. That was part of my femininity nurturing to nurture myself. I needed less like crazy responsibilities. So I stepped back from feeling stretched out and worn out with that stuff and I focused on my children. And honestly, motherhood is such a wonderful manifestation of femininity. I don't think you need to be a mother to be feminine or to be a feminine woman, but I do think motherhood is a wonderful opportunity to dive into like a different kind of like area of femininity where you're physically, mentally, emotionally nurturing like your child, you know, and it's a very special tender time. And so for me, the femininity journey became a lot less about like the stuff I love to talk about on my channel, like beauty and hair and like style. And it became a lot about 
setting up an environment for my children where they could thrive. So for me, that was making friends so we'd have play dates, getting them in a really good routine, feeding them nutritious food, taking care of myself so I could be my, the best version of myself when I was with them. Like a lot of that stuff, just like nurturing them by nurturing myself, nurturing like the, the parts of life, like keeping a home like kind of clean so it's not like chaotic, working on my marriage so they would have like mommy and daddy get along you know that kind of stuff so for me the femininity journey instead of being like a micro focus on little things it like zoomed out and it just became all about my kids and my new identity as a mother and of course I'm still me sorry my husband just called he wants to bring me a coffee from Big B yay anyways so what I if this makes sense what I'm trying to say is your femininity journey is going to look so different. Like when you're going through puberty versus when you're a new wife versus like when you're like a, in your single girl era or when you're turning 40, menopause, motherhood. There's common themes and the common theme to me is nurturing. That's why having character is really important. Seeking out wisdom, like learning to be peaceful. And I always come back to the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So for me, navigating femininity while being a mom, it didn't take away from my femininity journey. It just was like a new environment to practice femininity. And, and, it, and it's, it hasn't been easy the whole time, you know? I, I struggled with like a little bit of postpartum baby blues. There was a little bit of rage too, just like my emotions all over the place. So learning how to nurture myself and my kids with these new hurdles and obstacles and changes, that was just nurturing myself and my life. And you might've noticed I might be a little bit different than before I had kids. I have way less interest or care about the harsh topics of life. I don't ever really think or want to sit down and like talk about controversial things or like be on Twitter or argue with people like you might have noticed that about me but that's part of navigating my femininity journey I conserve as much energy as possible for my kids and I try to stay as peaceful and soft as I can for them because if mom's online like looking up conspiracy theories and arguing with people and like being intense what kind of energy does that bring to my kids? Like paranoid stress. That's not my job right now. That's not even life-giving, probably in general. So what I do now is I keep away from that stuff. I just push all of that out. And right now I'm focused on navigating like good routines, health, joy, and focus on our real life, social life like turning out the noise, like turning off the noise from the world and like not being paranoid and not being freaked out by every little thing, you know? So I don't know if any of that makes sense, but for me, it's just like wanting to give my kids the best life by acknowledging that part of making their life the best, like not perfect, but as best as I can, means taking care of myself, taking care of my marriage, taking care of my home, so that they're like surrounded in this wonderful environment. So I can do more videos on that if you're interested. Okay, also being in a healing season was the second part of that question. So I've also navigated this. Femininity brought me through a healing season. So I had a ton of grief. You guys have like, uh, if you're kind of peripherally aware, like I have some estrangement in my life. It is the most painful thing I've ever experienced. It like stripped me down to a core of a shell of a person. Um, trigger warning, trigger warning. Um, just, you know, very deep, dark grief where you are considering like not living anymore. You know, you know what I mean. And I honestly, th through all of that, that's when I found femininity. <laughs> that's when I found femininity and like the healing season it maybe you don't feel like an it girl maybe you don't feel like on top of the world like I got my mani pedi and my closet's organized my house is flowing I'm in a center of peace and joy like maybe you don't feel like that but femininity can be so wonderful and pull you out of the darkness like to me like God really used feminine femininity and that journey to give me so much to build in my life and to look forward to and to just nurture myself because as I talked about earlier femininity is about nurturing your like things in your life and when you're in a healing season you need to be nurtured and sometimes like 
the people in your life aren't going to nurture you. So you have to do it for yourself. So for me, femininity and exploring like, okay, I want to grow up my hair. I want to be healthy. I want to lose weight. I want to make my house beautiful. I want to learn how to bake and cook. And I want to connect with people online and get better at writing and have fun on Instagram, you know, like little soft stuff like that, that might be inconsequential for a lot of people. It like changed my life and it like made me have joy again. And it made me just like have so much to look forward to. And I don't, <clears throat> I don't know if I've ever talked about this before, but like six months before I started my YouTube channel, like I was really grieving a lot in my life and I felt really lonely and like it was just really hard. So doing homemaking and sharing it with all of you guys, like I don't want to say it saved my life, but it definitely like saved my joy and it helped me return to who I was like as a little girl, you know, just having fun and getting to know people and like being extroverted again and I've come so far and yeah I just I really think God can use femininity and just like getting in touch with who he made you to be to be really healing so sorry for crying <laughs> okay next question a little more oh, let's, let's switch up switch the gears so I won't feel emotional anymore okay should we do 50 50 while dating who pays um, I think I might give you advice that's like kind of surprising. So when I dated, I still remember the first time like a boy ever paid for me. I was like in the seventh grade, we were going to the movies as a big group of people. He bought my ticket and it was like a big deal. I was like, whoa, like I'm on a date. Like it felt like a date. Um, I don't think my parents would have liked that, but <laughs> it, it was really impactful to me. Just like the concept of like, oh, boys want to buy you stuff. Like it was kind of crazy. So I feel like having that happen at a really young age, I always just had the standard, like, of course you're going to buy my movie ticket and pay for dinner. Like it's the first date. And so I don't do 50, 50 on the first date. Um, but I, I have picked up the tab before, like I've gone out to dinner, like when I was still dating my now husband and I like, um, picked up the tab or I would go buy like over the top Christmas present or birthday present or Christmas present. Like here's a really expensive pair of hunting boots or whatever. Like I don't really have a problem like spoiling the man or whatever. But if I started feeling like this guy is like stingy, he doesn't want to provide, he doesn't want to take care of me. That'd be a problem. I've never dated anybody like that. Um, I have dated, I have not only dated just my husband um, and everyone who I've been with, I feel like they paid for a lot more things like, like activities, but then I would also like buy them gifts and do stuff for them a lot. So no, I don't do 50, 50. It's called going Dutch, which is funny because I have a Dutch background. Um, but yeah, I don't really go Dutch, not the first date. I don't know if it, maybe that would change now that I'm older. If I was single right now, I'm 28. If I was gonna go like meet a guy for drinks, like maybe I would buy my own drink, especially if I didn't, I, if I wasn't like attracted to him. I think that's the key. Like if I wasn't attracted to a guy and I didn't wanna keep going out, I think I would um, want to go 50-50. I, I wouldn't wanna feel like I owe him. Um, but if I was attracted and I wanted to keep going out with him, I would be like, really thankful and I think that's what you guys need to remember when a guy pays for you don't like avoid like drawing attention to the fact because I think sometimes people like to draw it like avoid thanking profusely or like in an exaggerated way because they don't want that person to like feel like yeah I did pay for you but like it's okay to be like oh my goodness thank you so much I had such a nice time like it makes them feel really warm and then they may want to like keep um picking up the tab or whatever and so and I just really think a well-placed like gratitude you can never go wrong okay where or how did I learn my parenting technique i.e happy mama happy baby honestly I think I learned this from a marriage book that I recommended a million times and I just kind of applied the concept to motherhood so the marriage book obviously is the empowered wife by Laura Doyle and the whole concept with that is like focusing on what you can change in yourself, in your life, in your marriage, and like who you are in your free time and blah, blah, blah. And like to, to be happy. And then that 
benefits the people around you and then it doesn't really matter what they're doing because you're happy if that makes sense so I kind of do that with motherhood where I was like I'm just gonna approach motherhood where I'm focused on like taking care of myself focused on my own issues and being happy like in my own self because then when I'm dealing with like sick toddler and tantrums and conflict and like whatever triggers you know I have a lot more resilience to that because I'm joyful I'm peaceful and yes that includes like scripture prayer bible study I do all of that um, but then it's also like mommy's gonna get a coffee let's go into the car we're gonna go through the drive through mom wants to go work out tossing you guys in the stroller let's go look at the Christmas lights um handing the reins over to my husband hey I'm gonna go run over at the um the sports center be back in 45 minutes like I just really prioritize like what I need to flow and function um and be happy and I guess I'm high maintenance because I like to get ready in the morning I like to exercise I like to have a clean house and so I try to prioritize all of that while also taking care of my kids and really being there for them um also I really vibe with the concept of attachment parenting where it's like and gentle parenting where it's like we like nurture this relationship and we love like I do not vibe with authoritarian parenting I grew up like that I think it can go very wrong um I'm not an expert I don't like condemn anybody I know a lot of you are gonna be different from me in this regard. That's totally fine. I love you, you guys know our channel is full of lots of different people. But for me personally, I could not follow through on that type of parenting style. The whole like intense, like I am the parent, you are the child like situation. I just, I want, I don't want animosity in my household. Like I don't want this like dark energy <laughs> where we are always just, conflict high conflict high animosity malice all of that so for me attachment parenting gentle parenting um really like flows with what i want to do but for me attachment parenting i didn't co-sleep i didn't breastfeed on demand i didn't baby wear for me it's more the concept of building an attachment with your child and nurturing that at every turn while also disciplining and having boundaries but just focusing on like building them up in a place where they feel so secure, so safe, like so loved, that just really resonates with me. So yeah, I guess my, my perspective just comes from like the moms around me that I resonate with. And also just my number one desire to have like a house where it's like love your neighbor as yourself, like kindness. Um, and not in like a superficial way, like be kind to each other while also like screaming your head off at your kids, you know, behind closed doors. I want everything behind closed doors to be the same as it is out in public. I don't want like secrets in our household where mom treats you different at home or, you know, I just, I have a lot of baggage with like the concept of how you treat your kids as you guys might realize. Um, so I'm hyper focused on my relationship with them. Maybe that's also why I don't want to like keep having kids right now like I'm focused on my, my two kids and and really like doing right by them not perfect but I want to do right by them um, and then also the book peaceful parents happy siblings drastically has affected how I parent I read it when I was pregnant with my second son because I wanted siblings that love each other and get along and again you're not going to be able to force that but you can like set up an environment that is like most suited to that outcome and that book fabulous 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 as you can tell by the title peaceful parents happy siblings like it's just like the marriage book it's so much more about what you do on your own as a as a person and that will affect like the outcome not that you have control over everyone's terrible behavior or you have like absolute rulership over their lives but it's more just like managing the things you can manage and letting go of the things you have to let go of and I think that's another thing I used to be a very anxious person and I really am not anymore and I know motherhood can be a time where a lot of anxiety can come out for people but for me I think it's made me less anxious because I just I'm so much like so focused on the fact that you can only control so much so that's why I focus on books like like peaceful parents happy siblings the empowered wife because it's like okay I can control this stuff and my kid 
like they're gonna be a kid they're gonna do what they're gonna do but at least I know I did as much as I could on on my own so that and then also just following awesome moms online who are just relaxed and loving their life I really like I think her handle is tired as a mother she lives in Australia love following her I really like um I really like uh okay did, did you get coffee yeah, oh can you bring it to me <laughs> Um, just focusing on, oh yeah, and then oh, a few supermodels, I kind of like how they parent too, just like relax, we're gonna travel, like no big deal, you know? I, I like that mindset, so that's where I got that philosophy. Thank you, love you. Not that I need more coffee, but I'm kind of excited. Also Gretchen Greer, I like following her online, she's just like really is all about the motherhood. She like did home birth and like all the stuff that I could literally never do. But I think it's important to remember, even if you don't do that side, like the physical stuff, like you can still have a very close relationship with your kids. Like my children are attached to me at the hip and I didn't like get to breastfeed for longer than like a month or two. So if you can't do those things, like, like the breastfeeding, the baby wearing, blah, blah, blah don't be discouraged like you can still have a very close relationship with your kids and I, there's a lot of fear mongering out there like oh you need to get golden hour your kid is gonna like you know not thrive that's not true okay I, I really encourage you to be careful with a lot of that kind of stuff like that makes you afraid as a mom like I said motherhood has helped me have less anxiety in a way because it's like you can't control everything um so why not just have fun that's also like my philosophy is like I'm gonna be doing this motherhood thing for a long time and I want to look back and be like wow I had so much fun I had so much fun in motherhood so that's kind of my goal like my goal is like it's not to like be so healthy or be so like uh protecting protecting them against all the dangers like yes i want to do that stuff but i just i want to have fun with it you know this is a fun question do i know my kitchener essence and kibby body type oh, you guys know if you've ever looked into kibby it is like but i have figured it out i'm a soft dramatic uh you can't tell like with photos and videos sometimes but like i'm tall i'm not short so i have like long bones but then I got my curves and some softness to my body, especially my legs. And most of all, when I wear soft dramatic lines, I look really good. So I always focus on my vertical. If you guys know what I'm talking about, I focus on vertical, focus on like clingy fabrics, blah, blah, blah. My Kitchener essence is hard to say. You guys would have to tell me that. Um, I don't know. I kind of try to follow classic romantic. Again, if you know, you know, I'm not going to take my Q&A time to explain Kitchener to you because that's crazy. But there's videos all over YouTube about it. Okay, how to sustain attraction in marriage. Hmm. Honestly, read the book, The Empowered Wife. So much of attraction, honestly, I think is like gratitude and remembering like who you're married to and seeing like his wonderful qualities and then also like nurturing those qualities so that you feel loved and then you feel attracted and it's this wonderful cycle that just feeds itself. So also I think keeping in shape, we both work out like every single day. We try to eat like decent, you know, we try to like make time for each other. We try to like flirt and, you know, be each other's best friend. We spend a lot of time together. <laughs> you know, he had his accident in June and it was really, really hard there for a bit because he was like, uh, had a cast on and couldn't do anything. But then there was like this chunk of time where he could walk around, he just couldn't go back to work because he can't chase after a criminal, you know? So we spent a lot of time together and it was awesome. Like we we're each other's best friends. And I think it's also important to not like, I think it's kind of important to have your blinders on a little bit, like focus on your man, not like some fantasy man from a book or, or your neighbor or some guy from church, like focus on your man and don't compare him to other men. Like just really like be grateful and, and tell him like you're grateful and try to be flirty and <laughs> I have a great blog post about like consent in marriage and like the whole intimacy side of things really encourage you to check it out but I'm not like a Christian homemaking wife who thinks you need to drop your drawers at every second like I don't think that's romantic and I think there is such thing as pursuit and we need to prioritize consent even if that means things are few and far between when you're in a hard stage of life 
like a huge part of sustaining my attraction to my husband is that when I was in a vulnerable postpartum state and even pregnant, like he didn't push me. He didn't make me feel bad. Like he just totally respected me. He respected my bodily autonomy and it made me feel so safe in those really vulnerable times in my life when I was medically vulnerable, emotionally vulnerable. Um, and he didn't push me to be intimate when I didn't want to. And that made me feel so like even more attracted to him because I knew he had my best interests in mind and he cared about my heart and my like perspective on things and he didn't just view me as like you're my wife like you gotta do what you gotta do and so I think sustaining attraction in marriage means always cherishing each other always respecting each other and yeah so maybe that does mean like so I got I hit a point where I'm like okay I want to feel healthy Again, I want to feel like a nice, you know, 28, 27 year old woman with a good libido. Like I'm going to go to the doctor. I'm going to go sort things out. Like I'm not going to go into detail about that, but you know, I got pelvic floor therapy. I've talked about that. Like I've, I've done things to also like meet him so I could be like, enjoy that side of marriage again, you know? So he gave me space, but then also I like have worked on it too. And like, we're just a team. And I think that's so important to remember you're a team. Um, you're an adorable little team that chose to make a family together. Like don't push each other away and respect, respect, consent, like so, so important. And I really feel like how your husband treats you, like you'll never forget how he treats you when you're postpartum and so medically vulnerable and having husband just come in, take literally feed my child, my oldest child, you guys know from the birth story that I keep referencing, having him come in and hold him when I couldn't take him from the doctor when I was like shaking from the meds and like a shell of a human like and f I, I'll never forget like rolling over in the night and I was like I literally felt like I was dying and I look and I saw him like tapping this newborn that he's literally like never held a newborn like he's never like taking care of a newborn and he's feeding Bodhi and he's taking care of him when I couldn't that just like set everything off on such the right foot where I just I felt protected, I felt taken care of, and I did my healing that I needed to do. And you guys know how the story went. I had another baby that same year. So you know that we were sustaining attraction in marriage. Um, and yeah, a really big part of it is just taking care of each other well. All right. How do I stay in the routine of getting dolled up? You can see. I'm all dolled up. Um. I think this is hard. I grew up with a mom who got doll dolled up every single day. Her mom got dolled up every single day. She was a model. It's just part of our family culture. So for me, it's like brushing your teeth. Like you wake up, you do your skincare, you do your hair, you do your makeup, you put on your clothes, you leave the bathroom. Like you don't leave the bathroom. Not that no one wants, like, okay, I do have days where I don't wear makeup. I don't feel like I can't leave the house without it. It's just like part of my routine. It makes me feel like put together like I can conquer anything I think it's also I have blonde eyelashes if I don't get dolled up you like I just look kind of sick and like not like myself you know and so for me having blonde eyelashes it's like well I'm at least gonna put on mascara oh and then if I put on mascara why not put on some concealer and then it just kind of snowballs from there so the routine is just treat it like brushing your teeth do it every morning um i wake up a little bit before the kids like 10 minutes you know i'm not a morning person but 10 minutes earlier than them so i can and i think also streamlining your beauty routine so if you're like oh this is taking forever and i hate doing it in the morning okay then cut out the things that you hate like you don't have to do all the things um for me i i don't do my hair every day i just leave it like this and that's that's how I do motherhood. I do the face, but I don't really do my hair. Um, so just choose what you want to do. For some people, that's do your hair, not your makeup. Like, it doesn't matter. Just make it like brushing your teeth. Oh, this question I thought was interesting. Are you praying for number three to be a girl? Like, as in, if I want my, like, third child to be a girl. I don't believe in wanting a certain gender. If Bodhi was a girl, if Troy was a girl, wonderful. Thank you, Lord, for my children. I really like when you see those gender videos, gender reveal, and the person's like really upset. I'm always like, why did you even have a gender reveal party if you knew you would be like mad about having the other gender? I just think that's really crazy. And I also don't believe in like wanting a specific gender. Like 
it's nice to have desires, but I don't like, I just don't vibe like that. Like, <laughs> I think we should just be grateful for the children like God gives us. I don't know. I, <clears throat> I grew up very familiar with the fact that most, like a lot of pregnancies don't reach full term. And so I think that just always put in my head, like, I'm just so grateful that God has given me a child, you know, I'm not saying I'm better than anybody, but I'm definitely saying like, I do not resonate with that. Um, would it be nice to have a girl? Absolutely. Like, that would be so sweet. Like, how fun would it be to have a little girl? Like, girl moms, that's awesome. I do love having boys because I love my children. I, I don't know. Like, no. I Short answer, no. Um, oh, baby names I loved but I didn't use. Oh, there's one for a girl that I'm not going to tell you just in case I do have a girl. But when I wasn't sure if Troy was a girl, my second name that I wanted, because um, he was supposed to come around Christmas. This is cheesy. I really wanted to name him Noel. How pretty would that be? Noel. I also have some names that like my my friends are named that, so I wouldn't name the kid, but I like the name. Um, but Noel, born around Christmas. Oh, wouldn't that be so pretty? Uh, Grant's grandma, uh, she's no longer with us, but her name was June. We wanted that for a middle name. Wouldn't that be so cute, Noel June? Well, maybe not that. But June is a middle name. Oh, adorable. Um, for boys, <laughs> we had Bodie picked out so early. The, you know, there's the skier Bodie Miller, and Grant and I love skiing. I don't think I've ever made a skiing vlog, but we usually go out west every year and downhill ski. So we also watch skiing films. There's like this whole genre of films where it's about skiing. And we like watched a ski film about Bodie Miller when we were dating or maybe newly married. Um, and so that's where we got the name Bodie. And it wasn't like after Bodie Miller. It was like, that's where we heard the name and we liked it. Um, and then we did Bowden for like a full name. Like if he was kind of a serious kid and Bodie didn't make sense. Like, and it wasn't like a really kiddish name in case when he's older, he wants to go by Bowden. Then Troy, we, we, <laughs> we just really liked the name. We loved the movie Troy. Um, and we liked how masculine it was and sporty. Like we kind of just wanted like sporty, cool, like names that would kind of like sound like a hockey player almost. <laughs> um, I know that's like not this like very spiritual, religious, magical reason for why we named our kids. We just liked the names. Um, I had a short list that had a lot of other names like Clark, Wes. I had one name that was on both short lists for the boys. I don't think Grant liked it. I like Stanley, <laughs> Stan the man. Just like masculine, fun, yeah, sporty names. Um, Henry, we had a grandpa named Henry, but it was a little too fussy for, for my taste. Uh, I have to pull it up. I have a list in my notes. Let's see if it'll come up. Oh, baby names, oh my goodness, okay. Oh, the girl ones are so pretty. So it's like Violet, Summer. Oh, I love the name Summer. Susanna, Helena, Paulina. Melody, Gemma, Diana, Cassidy, Hallie, Callie, Melanie. Oh, Sabrina. I love the name Sabrina. Okay, and then boys, what do we got? Okay, Adam, oh, Julian. Oh, I love that name. Julian, Alec, Hector, Hank, Pierce, Clay, Lionel, Stefan, Sean, <laughs> Conrad, Ian, some of those names are kind of crazy and I can see why my husband shot them down. So what happened is I went through the 1000 most popular baby names list for boys and girls. And then I just wrote down every single one that I liked. And then I ended up with about 15 girl names, 15 boy names. And then I read those lists to my husband. And from there, he picked the ones he liked. So the short list for Troy was Julian and Troy. Um, and we picked Troy. And when he was in my belly, I called him Mr. Troy. <laughs> okay, back to the Q&A. I hope that answers your question. I feel like I've seen Q&As before where like the people ask like, oh, what are some baby names you liked but didn't use? And the influencer like won't answer the question. And that always kind of annoys me because I'm like, then just don't like pick that question for your Q&A because I'm so curious. Um, so I hope like I, I gave you a lot of um, insight into the names I like. <laughs> I, I really answered that question. Oh, would I ever get a pet cat? Yeah, absolutely. How do I feel about my early YouTube videos? Honestly, 
I feel fine. I feel like I was a lot younger. I feel some nostalgia. I feel like impressed a little bit by the gall I had. Like some of those videos, guys, I don't think I could ever come online anymore and be like, how to be feminine in the feminist world. Like uh, that girl had courage. <laughs> I also think like I was just a different person than who I am now. So I like have a lot of the same beliefs but I also think I'm a lot more open-minded, which I think is good. I think, like I said, as I'm, I'm a mom now, I just don't care as much. I don't think it's that serious. Um, I think it's everybody's business, like to themselves, like how they live their life. I don't feel as passionate really. Um, I just feel passionate about encouraging people to be joyful and to live well and to dig into their femininity if they want to and to pursue their dreams and to not feel like they're alone. Like all of that is the same. But some of the more like detailed stuff, like how to be feminine in a feminist world or talking about like beauty standards or like more controversial stuff. I just like think, wow, girlfriend, like good for you. I, could, I couldn't do that now. Um, I don't know. I think it's just not for me anymore. You know, it's just not my, it's not that it's not my place. It's just not my passion. And I think maybe when my kids get a little older and I'm like wise and like 40 years old and no one cares about me online anymore, like it might be time to like write some books or some blog posts or get my mind going in that world. But when I became pregnant, like my whole world became about my kids. And so all that energy I might have put towards those topics before, now it's towards like kid stuff and real life friends and being like, like having, like I said, keep it saying, having fun, focusing on my routine, healing from birth, focusing on my marriage. Like I just, I just don't care about that stuff anymore. And I think that's okay. We all change. So yeah, I also cringe a little. I mean, I was pretty silly. People have made fun of me for the cringiness. But who doesn't look back on their early YouTube videos and like cringe a little? It's fine. I don't watch them. That's another thing. You couldn't pay me. You couldn't pay me to watch. <laughs> it's embarrassing. I like the vlogs though. It's really fun to have like my life cataloged. Um, what beliefs have stayed the same and changed since the beginning? Okay, in the beginning I was a lot more open to crunchy stuff. Now, I'm sorry to say, I am so turned off from most of that. Giving birth really cemented a lot for me um crunchy people i love you i'm glad you're here i don't really think that if you're watching this video you're the type of people that i'm gonna talk about right now but i feel like crunchy people can be and that whole part of homemaking and traditionalism is extremely judgmental panic inducing critical toxic and it's like an idol to a lot of people so I think in the beginning I was a lot more intrigued by like frolicking in a meadow and having like my chickens and being this like icon of homemaking where it's like I make everything from scratch and I'm like the the ultimate homemaker and now I'm like not interested in that at all I think it's great if you do that I don't think we need to like I I doll it idolize that and I don't think like you're better than other homemakers if you do that I think you can home make in an apartment in the city I think you can be a stay-at-home mom and never lift a finger on cleaning and have like a cleaning lady I know that might be controversial but that's what I believe I think there's lots of different lifestyles and I don't like the pipeline of homemaking to ultra traditionalism like homesteading if that's not what you want I think a lot of people want that and I love it. I love when you go where you want to be. I don't like the pressure, the undue pressure it puts on people, especially new mothers, you know? <laughs> like I had a crisis, like an identity crisis after giving birth and failing at it and needing a vacuum delivery and feeling like a terrible mother. And then I have an autoimmune disease that prevents proper breastfeeding without severe medical damage to myself. And so I couldn't do that. And then I'm like failing at all this stuff. And then you have crunchy people online being like, oh, if you just, you know, it's like manifestation. It's like you have to like be in the right emotional state for this right birth. And you know, it's like very victim blaming and I can't stand it. And it really annoys me. Um, and I don't think it's fair. And I think it's really gaslighting. And if you look at the comments on my birth story video, there are so many women who felt 
ashamed of their vacuum deliveries or their c-sections or whatever because this community like puts so much pressure on the woman to like deliver like in this natural way and to live life in a natural way and I just think again that's not fun and I think we need to like be a lot more open-minded with people and I think if you want me to be open-minded about home birth and natural stuff like that, you need to be open-minded toward my extremely hospitalized, wonderful elective cesarean. That's what some people want. And I think a lot of people can't handle that. So what beliefs have changed? I think I used to think a lot of that was innocent and now I think a lot of it's toxic. Um, I also think like I'm so much less focused on like, oh, as a wife and a mom, like I need to do it all. I need to be like this perfect, amazing um, homemaker. And I need to like push, push, push and like do all the things. And now I'm much more focused on like just living a full life and having friendships. And like, it doesn't matter so much like the appearance of things. Okay, I hear my kid, he's like waking up. I don't know if you can hear that. So I'm gonna quickly share my big life update and news. This is the last video I will be making in this house. This is the last living room chat I'm gonna be making in this house because we are moving. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. We bought a new house. We're not moving towns. We're just moving a few blocks away. I never thought this would happen because I literally wanted to be wheeled out of this house and head towards the funeral home because <laughs> I love this house so much. We've put our blood, sweat, and tears in it. This is the first house I lived in since I got married. It's the only house I've lived in. I've put my soul into this house, um, but some things have changed. And a lot of you guys ask, how do I let my husband lead in marriage? This is a big area where I have decided to let my husband lead in marriage. And I'm really glad because now that it's happening, I'm really excited, but I was scared. I like didn't even want to go look at the house really. I didn't want to like move. It's a whole long story. Um, and I'm going to save it for an exciting new year's vlog where I'll tell you the whole story. I'll, I'll show you the house. Like it's going to be really exciting, but that's why Christmas has been weird. That's why I've been kind of absent on Instagram. Um, and absent on YouTube the week after I posted my autumn vlog we looked at the house and life has not been the same since then that's all I'm gonna say I'll put it all in the vlog thank you so much I do have to go get my kid he come he sounds like a little upset so thank you for watching if you're interested in more of this kind of content I have another Q, like a few other Q and A's on the channel it'd be kind of interesting to see how different like I answer the questions definitely the how many kids is going to be different um but I also have some vlogs so thank you to everyone who was hung in there I hope you have a wonderful holiday season wonderful rest of your year thank you for 200k um it's something I never thought would ever happen in my entire life it's honestly insane to have this with all of you big community like I said earlier in the video it's changed my life to have all of you to be here um I just can't thank you enough I honestly sincerely can't so yeah got excited for moving content it's it's a lot I know I'm gonna cry but it's a wonderful Christmas gift and I'm really excited and I'll, I'll share it all in the next vlog so have a wonderful day stay safe stay blessed love you